So uh, we talked a little bit in the morning lecture section about proof of work. And we kind of touched on it briefly and, and talked about what the proof of work problem is and sort of why it's important. So since you're actually going to be mining uh, Feathercoin and doing real proof of work with your PCs here, I thought it'd be good to do just a quick five, 10 minute sort of re, uh, rehashing of what proof of work is and uh, how it actually works on the algorithm level for maybe the CS people in the room that want it up. So remember, we have this chain, this ongoing chain of transaction data that serves as like a global distributed <coughs> ledger of who is transacted with who. So Dr. Serapelia has a wallet. He sends some Bitcoin to my wallet. I maybe send some to one of you here in the front row because I'm feeling generous. And over time, every 10 minutes or so roughly for the Bitcoin network, these transactions are aggregated into what are called blocks. And that's like a batch processing of these transactions. Now, each of these includes some transaction metadata and the real data and a, that random value that we talked about called a nonce, and we're going to review that as well. And you run this through that SHA-256 hash algorithm, and you get what's called a block hash. So how do we actually arrive at this block hash? When these transactions are all pulled together, they're not actually constructed into a specific block until it gets to the miners running the software. So when you send a new transaction to somebody, that is flooded out across the Bitcoin network to all the people running this peer-to-peer -peer software. So you create a transaction signed to send some Bitcoin to him. That transaction has a certain format, and that data is broadcast across the world to all the Bitcoin nodes, including miners. And they sit in what's called the mempool. It's a memory-based, you know, it's a stored in memory, a pool of uh, new transactions that haven't yet been included in a batch processing block. So what the miners will do then is the uh, people running the mining software will pick a bunch of transactions out of the memory pool, and they usually do so, uh, you know, pick in order of like the highest fees if they can't get all of them in the next block. So they'll pick the transactions they want, and they'll construct what is called a candidate block. So again, that block has some, some the real transaction data in it, which is all of the information, the digital signatures, and the outputs, and the inputs that are consumed, and that sort of thing. You don't have to worry about that. But what's important for the mining algorithm is what's called the block header. So the block header contains a bunch of information, sort of a summary of the transactions, and important data for constructing the blockchain. So I might not get all of this off the top of my head, but some of the important ones are like, there's a timestamp. So it actually recording you know, when the information goes into the block. There is the previous block hash, which is really important for uh, linking up transactions in the past and making the blockchain immutable. That's a really key, important part of that. Um, and there's a nonce. Uh, the nonce is a random value that we're going to compute and we're just going to guess at to try to you know, get some information uh, to get this hash output that meets certain criteria. And what's also in this block header is you have essentially a transaction summary. Um, what this actually is, is it's the root of a special um, data structure. So uh, how many of you are CS majors? You touched on binary trees yet. So you might be somewhat familiar. There's a special type of binary tree that can be used to sort of summarize data. Uh, it's called a Merkley tree. Uh, that's a really key data structure in the blockchain. So essentially, we can have a cryptographic summary of the, all the transaction data to be included in the block header without having to have all that data be hashed by the miners. So this transaction summary, this Merkley root, is included in the block header. And again, we have some other information in there. I might be a little fuzzy off the top of my head, but uh, getting the important stuff. So the miner generates this candidate block with this 
header. You have this transaction summary information, a timestamp, a previous block hash. And what the miner is actually guessing at is this nonce. So this nonce is a, a, just a random number value. And somebody asked a really good question in the morning section, which is, you know, can you sort of predict which guesses are better than others? And the answer is no. So when you're guessing, you can increment a counter, you can use a cryptographic random number generator, you can do whatever you want. It really is truly just a random guess. And that's all that matters. So this is just, just any number. So this can literally be like zero to you know, just incrementing on into infinity. You take this, all of this block header information, including the nonce. So you take the block header, including that random value, and you run it through, in the case of Bitcoin, SHA-256 hashing algorithm. And you get some output. So you get some hash that's just some. We're going to talk about this in actually the form of like binary numbers. So day to day we use base 10, right? You have digits 0 through 9. We're going to talk about binary, which is how computers see this. So let's just say, for example, we have some output 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. I did a talk in Denver where I did a little simulation using 8-bit numbers. I think that's a pretty good way to explain it on a smaller scale. In real Bitcoin, these numbers are 256 bits. So a lot, I have to draw a lot more ones and zeros on the board. What makes the problem a problem to solve is what's called the difficulty target. So this is a number that is actually chosen sort of in consensus by all the nodes on the network uh, interacting with each other and, and you know, working on this rule set that Bitcoin has. This difficulty target is adjusted by you know, sort of estimating the amount of computing power that's on the network going towards mining. And it adjusts how hard this problem is every 2016 blocks. So like, just basically periodically, every couple weeks. Um, and so how this works mathematically is kind of the interesting thing. You can think of this difficulty target as a 256-bit number, just like your hash output. So let's say, for example, our difficulty target is going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. So, eight. So this is actually eight in binary. I'm pretty sure, maybe one, two, yeah. four, eight. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So this is you know base ten. This is base two. So we have this difficulty target here, and in order for this to be a correct guess, so in order for this nonce to be the proof of work that we did all this guessing work, this hash output, which is this fingerprint of the block data in the nonce has to be less than this difficulty target. So let's say we literally started out with our nonce at zero and we're just incrementing a counter for our guesses. This is our first hash output here with a nonce of zero. Does this meet our difficulty requirements? Well, no, because this 256-bit number here is bigger than the difficulty target. So we keep guessing. And we just repeat this process over and over and over again. So let's say you know it takes us uh, 200 guesses down the road, and we get a hash output that is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. I think that's, yeah, 8 bits. There we go. So now our miner has solved the block. That's sort of the terminology they use. The miner found a, a guess that gives us a hash output that is less than our difficulty target. So the miner now has a block with all this transaction data and it has a nonce that solves this problem. So let's just say, for example, let's just say this nonce happens to be, you know, yeah, 200, right? You know, we had 200 guesses, or I guess it'd be 201, but close enough. Um, they now have a block that meets the proof of work requirements set by the network. So remember, they had to expend a lot of guessing power to get to get to this number. I mean, 200 isn't really a lot, but in real Bitcoin, I mean, this number is <coughs> billions, trillions of guesses, huge, huge, huge numbers. 
the rest of the network doesn't have to guess again. They can run the candidate block through SHA-256 and get that same get get that same hash because remember our hash function is deterministic. Every time you put an input through, you get the same output. So the only way to find an answer to this problem is to guess, but anybody on the network can actually verify that the answer is correct instantaneously. So that's how consensus is built on these networks. Essentially, you know, for somebody to pull off a fraud, remember I had said in the earlier lecture that somebody would have to outguess everybody on the network to get a new block. The only way anybody on the network would accept a fraudulent block with like a fake transaction in it would be if you had an answer to proof of work. Because the rest of the nodes on the network are going to validate every block and make sure that it meets the rules. If the block doesn't meet the rules, it gets rejected. Nobody cares. Nobody cares about your history because it's wrong. And that's how this consensus is built across the network, because everybody is working together to make sure that everybody else is following the rules. And that's done using cryptography. So this is provable mathematically that you have an answer that means, essentially, that you expended some amount of computing work. It turns out that the smaller the difficulty target gets, the lower probability you have of a guess being correct. So if this number, if I, if I shift over the difficulty target, so you need, uh, in binary, you need five leading zeros for a valid answer instead of four, that takes more computing power on average to find an answer. So this is, again, this is provable. There's actually like a summation problem that Satoshi Nakamoto does in the white paper to prove how this algorithm works. So the reason they call it proof of work is based on probability, we know that if you found an answer to this problem, it is provable that you have done work. You have expended a bunch of electricity, you have expended your computing resources with your mining hardware to find an answer to this. And so that's how the rest of the network knows that you can pull off a fraud. It's, it's, a, it's an actual like sort of economic game. And so that's about what there is to it in Bitcoin. Um, so what this means then is you have a candidate block and a miner finds a valid nonce. It will immediately then propagate that block to the rest of the nodes and say like, hey, I found a solution. And if all the other nodes validate that everything is correct, all the transactions follow the rules, um, the proof of work uh, answer is correct, then that block becomes part of the blockchain. And that information gets propagated around the network. Once somebody has found a new block and it's part of history then, the arms race continues on to the next block. So the next round of transactions out of the mempool get siphoned up into candidate blocks and the mining begins. It's just a constant race that resets approximately every 10 minutes. That's not an exact time because again, it's just a matter of finding an answer to the problem. But what the Bitcoin network does is it adjusts the difficulty of the problem, this difficulty target, um, occasionally so that if a lot more miners come on the network or a lot more miners drop off, that variable of the time stays, stays constant. Uh, different coins use different algorithms. So Bitcoin uses SHA-256. It's most of its derivatives as well, like Bitcoin Cash uh, use SHA. Litecoin uses Script, which is actually a password uh, password. A key derivation function, sort of. It's, it's uh, designed to have some different properties. I don't want to go too far into it, but I want to let you get to the lab. Does anybody have any questions on proof of work? You don't necessarily have to know all this to do the lab. It just thought it would, you know, we thought it would be cool to take a little deeper dive into it. So, all right. Thanks again, everybody.